still we have this idea like before the Big Bang that there was nothing. But I actually think it was the other way around. I think it was everything. And then the Big Bang is the beginning of, of very particular things. I think the purpose of this whole thing is surprise. It's sort of like a being that could make anything decides, well, it would be cool if I could make something that could make something then surprise me. I think it's likely that we will speciate. I think it's for certain that we're gonna make and invent thousands of different species of AIs. You know, whether this kind of walking barefoot in the woods and being, knowing how to plant a seed and have it turn into a plant, is that one of those qualities that we absolutely don't ever want to let go of? I don't know. Maybe, mm. maybe not. Um, wow. We have a moral obligation to make new technologies, to make new opportunities, so that every person born would have at least the chance to have their genes sh shine and shared. Well, how did you wake up? Many different paths. And I think that's the answer. Yeah. No, someone's opinion may contradict yours. Where's my friend Alan? It's all about your perspective. Who are we and what is the nature of this reality? What's up, everyone? Welcome to Simulation. I'm your host, Alan Sakian. We are on site in the beautiful Pacifica, California. We are now going to be talking about what's next and much more. We have Kevin Kelly joining us on the show. Hi, Kevin. Hey, it was great to have you here. Thanks so much for coming on the program. What a beautiful day. It is. It is. And you have quite the background that is paragraphs long, so I'll give the short uh, clip of it. Kevin Kelly is an expert on macro trends of civilization and technology. He co-founded Wired Magazine in 1993, has written multiple New York Times and Wall Street Journal bestselling books, is on the board at the Long Now Foundation, and much, much more. You can find the links in the bio below, kk.org. Also, his Twitter profile, find all his books as well. All right. Kevin, we have been spending a lot of time on trying to understand the ultimate nature of reality. Mm. And I would like to hear what your thoughts are about that. So we're going to start big yeah, and then get bigger. <laughs> <laughs> we'll start with the small stuff and then work up. Um, the nature of reality. Well, the, the, the honest truth is that um, I and the rest of humans have no idea. I mean, really. We, we, we have no idea. We have theories. We have metaphors that we use. Um, but we just don't know. And it's very clear, even from the terminology, where we have what we know what we know says that 95% of physical stuff is unknown, it's dark matter, and 97% of all the other intangibles is dark energy, which means that we have no idea about really what the basis is. I, but nonetheless, we have theories, we have, we have suspicions, we have hunches, we have metaphors mostly. And I think, for me, one of the most promising metaphors and with the promising frameworks to try to understand things is to assume that the fundamental reality of anything physical things that would hurt our toe if we dropped it um are going to be very intangible very much dematerialized, very much informational, if not spiritual. So mm. there is a famous physicist, Wheeler, who says, uh, it's or bits. Mm. Anything that's an it is actually made of bits. Mm. And so I think the next big step in us trying to understand the basis of reality will be coming to kind of an informational-based view of both like things like physics and the rest of the world that we will kind of come to interpret through this notion that 
everything real is really made up of nothing, made up of bits, made up of some kind of immaterial thing. And that's a suspicion more than I could roll out evidence for, but you know, if we look at the subparticles and the subparticles and the subparticles, and at some point, it seems likely to me that there's going to be something intangible at the bottom um, that will be close to our ideas of what we think about information. So, so, so I am biased to the idea that the underlying basis of reality is informational. But I wouldn't be able to prove that, and I think the evidence for it is very circumstantial. But that's my hunch. Does it feel like we are all one? Well, so the answer to the question in the short hands, yes, it does. And in a very logical sense, there is only one life on this planet. I mean, there literally is only one life. There's a, the first cell, the very first cell, divided into two cells with the same life in it, and those t two cells divided into two, and we are all just descendants of that same dividing cell, that v unbroken line of, I mean, literally, a literally unbroken life of that division. There's not a single gap between us and that original one. Okay? And so we are descendants, and so, we, yes, at one level in a very real sense we there's only one life um when humans say that we sometimes talk about kind of you know something higher not just life but other levels of consciousness and even that that's um remains to be seen um i i i think that uh um I think that the, again, reflecting kind of what we know about physics, I think the amount of what we know is growing exponentially, but the amount of what we don't know is even growing faster. And that's because in, in, in science, most of what you get in science is answers, but you get two new questions for every answer. So, so ignorance is actually expanding faster than our knowledge, and so you could say in a certain sense, the main product of science is an expansion of ignorance. <laughs> and as you know, with two exponential curves, the difference is exponential. So we are actually increasing ignorance exponentially. And so having said that, it's true that, we're, that our knowledge is expanding tremendously fast, but there is so much that we don't know um, uh, that you have to be, I don't know, somewhat uh, some level of vanity to kind of state anything with certainty, I believe. And I think, you know, the, the whole point of science is that it's provisional truth. <laughs> and um, when we don't know so much of the fundamental nature of the universe that it's hard to rely on a, 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 something that you're worth dying for in any, any aspect. And, you know, we in our own lives are busy and we, informed and educated, I'm a science groupy, geeky guy, mm -hmm. but even I um, have to have a kind of a belief in atoms. I believe in atoms mostly because people who know a lot more about it have told me that they really exist, right? I mean, it's like I, I, mean, I could do some kind of experiments that might kind of suggest strongly that they exist, but understanding them as an atom, you know, there's an atom, uh, oxygen atom right here, and it has these, that is, for me, really something that I have taken on because other people who know a lot more about it have convinced me, or enough of them, and that, and that that idea fits into everything else we know. And so, um, so for me, science is really this web. It's a, a constructed web of consensus and that for something to be added to it, it has to be added to, 
has to make sense when all the parts already exist. So when you add something new to science, it has to not only kind of match that adjacent area, it has to match everything that we already know. It's a big, it's a big step, and that's why sometimes we're slow to kind of bring something into the arena of what we know as science, because it actually has to kind of match everything we know. And one of the reasons why you can have these islands of knowledge, like semantic knowledge. Well, there's, there's the things about there's semantic knowledge and some other ways of knowing things. They can actually be consistent among themselves and within that body of knowledge. But the problem is, is that it's not intersecting with all the other things that we know. And so it doesn't mean that they're wrong. It just means that we cannot bring them into science because they just don't match with everything else that we know. And I like to think about, you know, there's a kind of a, mm, there, there, there's a, a statement that's not true when we talk about um, the discovery of the gorilla happening in, you know, 1800s or something. Because it's very clear that humans knew about gorillas way before them. But there was something true about the fact that even though there was rumors of gorillas and these monster men and stuff, um, in the 1800s, the gorilla knowledge was brought into science. It was fitted. That knowledge, which had been local and very parochial, was brought into the whole scientific world, and it was connected to everything else we knew about animals and the natural world. And so in that sense, it was discovered, but it was just being discovered by science, meaning that it had to fit in to everything else that we already knew. And so, um, so you know, are we one, I think, is a question that we're going to be asking for a long time. Um, and uh, I think there are going to be, you know, there's many ways to answer it, but I, but, but I think the answer it, it fundamentally is it's one of those things that we don't know um, and will take a long time. I, I, I suspect the, the, that the other way to answer that is that we're going to also have this decision ahead of us is not just like are we like of one mind of one thing but this, we're going to have a real decision as a society is whether we want to remain as one species or not okay so 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 so, so as we go forward um we're taking on we're we're going to self-direct our own evolution our own genetics and there will be plenty of pressure, plenty of um, interest in modifying ourselves. And there will also be plenty of people, and I know some of them, who will say neither I nor any of my descendants will ever manipulate, intentionally manipulate our genes, even for the so-called better. And that would lead to some very good prospect that there might be a forking. And once you do one fork, schisms are just in the cards. And so, um, and so the prospect is, is that we, you know, unless there is also a, just a general consensus that there shall not be that division, that we won't allow it, which would mean basically that we're going to prohibit um, the engineering. But outside of that, it's very likely that we would begin to see multiple varieties of our being <coughs> Excuse me. And at the same time, uh, maybe even um, in our minds, how we how we think. So I I make up a little four by four <coughs> quadrant of possible futures, and the question is is um, are we of one species or many species, and one mind or many minds? And so you can imagine a world in which we remain. One common species with many minds. That's sort of what we have right now. We have one species with many individual minds. We could be many species with many individual minds. But as we look forward, we could also be um, one species where all our minds are joined in a kind of telepathic superorganism kind of we're all being connected. 
So we have one species and uh, um, one mind, or we could even have many kind of species and one mind, where we're connected to all the machines and everything else and, and that. So we have various, and we all have one mind. So um, I'll hit the ball back now. Yeah. I love the breadth. I love the <clears throat> polymathic worldview. <clears throat> Excuse me. Generalist worldview. Uh -huh. I'm so deeply, um, that lights a fire under my right. uh, spirit deeply. So to hit the ball back here, you're ending on something that many call collective consciousness, mm -hmm. this, at, this oneness. Right. So within this, Many times we'll get to this part of the, in the conversation mm -hmm. as well, where we talk about this, this edge of civilizations and knowledge mm -hmm. being pushed. Yet, it's also so interesting that this idea of the ultimate nature of reality can also be right here. As we look... Here? I mean, like, right here? As we look mm -hmm. in each other's eyes. Sure. In deeply mm -hmm. feel mm -hmm. and if we practice that mm -hmm. over and over and over yeah. again right something so profound mm -hmm. that's beyond words right occurs sure and so it's here sure this nature of reality is equally here as it is where it's pushing the edge of civilization's knowledge where you gave this mm -hmm. idea of we push an edge in one of these fields and then immediately we learn our ignorance is so much greater. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And also another aspect of what you were mentioning is going back in this evolutionary process to the beginnings of life, the genesis of life on this planet we can go back even further to the genesis of what is postulated as a big bang or what many yeah. call creation or source right. or sure, all sure. that is or God uh -huh. or whatever people want to call it, that that is one and we are all descendants of yes. that. Right, yes, yes, yes. And so then is it then that our ignorance of that our feelings of separation from that oneness, from that mm -hmm. deep interconnectedness mm -hmm. with this oxygen that we inhale that comes from phytoplankton mm -hmm. and trees. There's scientific ways to discuss the interconnectedness as well. Mm -hmm. Is that the most root, the most upstream issue is the lack of understanding of that interconnectedness, of that unity, of feelings of separation? Um. I would agree with everything you said, but the question you were saying, is it the most important upstream issue? I, I, that I don't know. Um, what, uh, would, what could be up there as well then? Upstream issue. Do you mean sort of what is blocking us from progress? Or, or is that what you mean? Or I'm not sure even maybe what you mean by upstream issue. Mm -hmm. What do you mean by that? Mm -hmm. So... We mentioned this a little bit ago yeah. as well, that when we look deeply sure. and we feel that the nature of reality seems to also arise even simply here. Okay. So then there is something here that is not practiced enough by us. Enough for what? Enough for feelings of understanding the nature mm. of reality. And so, again, it's feelings of understanding the nature of interconnectedness, of mm -hmm. oneness. Is that the most upstream issue that we're not embedded well, I, in? I don't in know ourselves. what you mean Probably. by upstream yeah. issue. This is what I'm saying. What, what okay. do you mean by upstream issue? Meaning that as a collective to hone our attention on that could be the most impactful for cascading the greatest symbiosis and flourishing mm -hmm. moving forward. Um, it's a good question. I, I, I maybe have um, my mm, my tendency is not 
to believe that there's a single roadblock or a, a particularly large problem that is sort of, if we solve that problem, we're, we're, I, I think we have a, a network, a, a whole collection of problems that are all intertwined, and that's certainly part of it. And I think being able to overcome that would help, but I don't think that is sort of like something that stands alone by itself. Um, I, I, my, my map of reality is, is that these things are all deeply interconnected and that that issue of understanding deeply the interconnected oneness or unity of the world and people, while essential and important, is not alone. It's what are the other ones up there as root or upstream issues for you? Um, yeah, so it's you know it's like all these things that have to happen at once. Um, I was just reading about the axial age and, and whether that was uh, actually um, the, the idea of the axial age was you know, in about 1000 BC there was around the globe um, all these societies who kind of at the same time in history decided to under to, to, to position to, to see themselves um, as and, and to think about the transcendent and to kind of invent these modern religions of monotheistic religions or even kind of the Buddhists where you had you, you, you kind of had this transcendence and that and, and I think it's no coincidence that that came along with the you know the invention of civilization and it was per and it was it was because we had a certain level of um, prosperity that allowed us to think about those kinds of things, all right? And so, um, and, and so what, 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 one of the things that, that is necessary for us to continue progress in the development of our humanity and making us better humans is, you know, the, the basic um, having enough food, shelter, water, for everybody in the world, I mean, it's 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 very hard to it's very hard to progress in enlightenment when you are hungry, and I think the idea that yeah. somehow starving people are more spiritual is just completely wrong. I mean, there is there is a sense of of um, What's the word I want? Fasting and asceticism can commune you with the divine as when well. When it's voluntary. Yeah. Yes, yes. <laughs> yes. When, when you elect, when you have enough resources to do that deliberately, yes. but when you are dragged into it, when it's not your choice, when it is something that is done in desperation, yeah. um, there is a sense in which you are kind of closer to the present but only in the animal way mm. okay and people have moments of transcendence you know as they're dying or whatever but that's not what we're talking about we're talking about how to make us better at our best and i think it requires a certain amount of um we'll call it, we can call it leisure or a certain amount of um of progress or a certain amount of liberty a certain amount of things basic needs being met exactly for us to be the best that we are mm -hmm. and so part of this gateway is not just the and so you know we want to we want to have those opportunities spread out around the world and we want to have more people who are not hungry every day would and, you say to unleash the full inner artist absolutely right and so um now the question is, well, what's blocking that? And yeah, I mean, at some point, the the the, the understanding that you know war is stupid and um, you know fighting, but all those things are actually propelled by the lack of resources and the lack of opportunity. And so, so it's a 
the, 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 these issues are tightly wound to each other, and that's why I don't really want to separate them and say, that, well, it's, yeah. if we just had understanding about the oneness of our own life, we can go on. That does help, but that's not the only thing. So uh, you asked what other ones? And so I think these issues of, um, of opportunity, basic, basic progress, um, things like literacy, um, the other kind of literacies we were just talking about, scientific literacy, numeracy, um, um, issues of, uh, you know, th the spread of, of opportunity and the, um, of true opportunity around the world in, in, in that diverse way, right? So the liberation of women, half of the mm -hmm. sky, you know, being brought into this, those things, I think, are part of that mm -hmm. answer. Mm -hmm. And so, um, you know, in this campaign, in our quest to become better, however we want to define it, and that's an interesting question, um, I think it's a multi-front um, effort. Uh, and and, and, and yeah. th 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 I think there's, there's many things, and they're listed. We kind of have to do them all at once. That's the weird yeah. thing. Yeah. I like the ones that you picked uh, around um, literacy, around um, spiritual scientific literacy, also mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. the basic needs being met for everyone to unleash their full inner artist. Right. I really love those. Right. Yeah. So, you know, I have a little rant, which I, which I will do right now, talking about the role of technology in this. And so... Um, I like to have this thought experiment where we could imagine um, a genius artist, let's take Mozart, mm. being born 2,000 years before he was. Mm. Same person, same genes, everything, being born 2,000 years before he was. And he would have been, you know, maybe a farmer, maybe a herder. And his genius would have gone completely mm. wasted because mm. there was no symphony, there was no piano for his genius mm -hmm. just walking around being a herder uh, maybe he played a flute you know nicely but and so he would have died and 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 that moment would have gone but we in, we invented the technologies of the piano and this and the symphony and so he was born into and so his genius could just flourish his artistry was just and he could share, and it was great for the world and great for him. Well, you know, we can imagine um, Lucas, um, you know, Hitchcock being born before the technologies of cinema, and what a waste that would have been if they had been born before those technologies. And so Shakespeare being born after writing was invented. Um, so I say that there is a Shakespeare and a Mozart born somewhere in the world today, mm -hmm. and she's waiting for us to invent the technology for her genius that she could be shared, and that therefore we have a ob moral obligation to expand those possibilities, to increase new technologies, and to make sure that the basic other necessities of food and clean water is available to all those on the planet and those unborn. And so we have a moral obligation to make new technologies, to make new opportunities, so that every person born would have at least the chance to have their genius sh shine and shared. Yes, I will enjoy speaking with you, hopefully in a little bit, about the actual design of that social fabric mm -hmm. that enables the inner artist to be fully unleashed mm -hmm. around mm -hmm. the world. I would like to also ask, does it feel like this reality is perfect? This, when you say this, you mean the one that we're in right now or the one that I'm talking about? Does it feel that everything is perfect? No. Is perfect? I don't believe in perfect. I'm not a utopian by any means. I think perfect is way overrated. Why? Because it's dead. One of my definitions of God is sort of like, 
you know, perfection that keeps getting better, which is sort of, you know, it's like, what, <laughs> what that's a weird thing. So um, I, I think uh, most, you know, perfect means that it can't get any better. Well, then it's like dead. It's, it's dorm, it's static. Is this reality a perfect balance of good and evil, a perfect ascension that we're all experiencing through consciousness? I doubt it. I doubt it. Um, now, um, you know, it's sort of like, it might be, I mean, I, I, I think, like, if, if you take this idea, in your question is this idea that there are alternative universes with different arrangements of things. Um, I think every one of those, if, if, there, if that is, if there is a multiverse with many different arrangements, every one of them will have a, a different trade-off, you know, and a different character and a different thing. And so um, there may be some universes where things are really keen, but there can't be any mangoes. That can't be. So it's like, who wants to go there? Is the sum of all <laughs> of the multiverse, is that perfect? I doubt it. I have another question. What would be the purpose of this reality being made? This, I mean, again, this, what we're in right now, our, our reality? Of everything, of all that is. Why is this? Yeah, yeah, exist? yeah. Well, you know, that's been the $64,000 question from the very beginning. People ask, you know, why something versus nothing? And um, again, What's the telos? Sure, sure, sure. Um, the, 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 general, the, the, the general kind of intuition, particularly when we look at the scientific view of the Big Bang, is that the origin of all this stuff, this something, if it goes back and back to this moment, mm -hmm. that kind of before the moment, even though there is no before the before, because time is... There was no time, so we can't really talk about before the Big Bang because there was no, there was no before the before. But still, we have this idea, like before the Big Bang, that there was nothing. But I actually think it was the other way around. I think it was everything. And then the Big Bang is the beginning of, of very particular things, mm. of nothing, including nothing that there was, there was kind of nothing, space, and then there was these very particular things, taken out of all the possible everything. Everything meaning literally, literally, all possible possibilities. And so um, I think the purpose of this whole thing is surprise. Mm. I think, think there's a, a being that was self-made, a self-made being. And the purpose of this embodiment of that, that self-made being is surprise. Mm. So um, it's like to make something that this omniscient self-created thing could do mm. that was gonna surprise itself. Mm. And we're here to surprise God. Mm. Um, and so, you know, uh, it's sort of like a being that can make anything decides, well, it would be cool if I could make something that could make something then surprise me. Mm -hmm. Okay, we get that. And that's what we're gonna be doing ourselves. We're gonna be making <laughs> robots and stuff and they're gonna, we're gonna give them creativity and they're gonna surprise us. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. This one's a, a fun one that this being made in, for the process of becoming more alive, understanding itself mm -hmm. better, mm -hmm. right. being creative, the symphony right. expressing itself artistically. 
it's one of the favorites that we love uh, discussing. Mm -hmm. All right. I would like to ask another theme, and this is one that leads us somewhat into uh, the architecting of the social fabric to maximize the artistic uh, expressions. It also leads us into the pro some of the projects that the, even the Long Now Foundation mm -hmm. is doing with the mm -hmm. Rosetta Project. There is an ethnographic condensation that is happening on the planet mm -hmm. out of the 7,000 languages. About half mm -hmm. of them are not being taught. So we're very quickly, most people learning English, mm -hmm. Mandarin, we have Arabic, we have Hindi, we have Spanish, we have these languages, most, most common ones. And then we have these principles of what feels like in many ways of many of these languages that are not being uh, passed on that have a deep sense of interconnectedness with one another and with their environment symbiotically in let's take the best case scenario of an immediate return hunter gatherer style is it principles like that that our that are in a sense missing in modernity in these massive metropolises and the that the, what are the principles like principles like which 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 ones uh, um, just yes. repeat that last question yes yes principles like deep interconnectedness with each other and with mm -hmm. the environment. Okay. Things like the children being able to actually see mm -hmm. the galaxy mm -hmm. and the universe. Mm -hmm. Things yeah, like yeah. the apple, not just being a sheet of paper for the apple, but rather actually observing the process of the seed, the mm -hmm. tree, the right, apple, right, right. that process. Right. Right, and, and 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 the question is is like, are we losing something vital mm. if we lose those mm. in the in the kind of mm. modernity? And, and and may we potentially uh, design, architect our social fabric mm -hmm. of that future that takes some of these principles mm -hmm. and really challenges modernity with wanting to architect include inclusively of those principles. Yeah. Um. So, so, so I, I think my guess is that um, the more rounded a person is, that better that person will be a human. Mm -hmm. And there is certainly, um, There's certainly going to. I, I don't think human nature is static or sacred. I think it is very malleable, and part of what we're going to be doing is changing our very nature. We're not the same people that walked out of Africa a million years ago. We have we have changed. So there 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 are there are things that we have already left behind, and that is in the nature of evolution. Um, at the same time. Since we don't know where we're going, we want to retain as many different varieties and approaches and understandings as we can, because who knows what we're going to need. And we don't even know what is actually vital. So I think, um, I think, just, I think it's, it's, we can be conservative by conserving some things as we go along. Other things I think we can give up. And, and we don't know what those are. And I think... Um, we should pay attention to that and we should be very deliberate ab about it. But I'm not, uh, I'm not going to be sorry if we leave some things behind, some, some choices. That's, that is in the nature of evolution is you can't hold on to all the options. You have to surrender some of them. You want to maximize when you want to keep as many going as possible. Mm -hmm. 
You always want to be able to, you don't want to burn your bridges, but you're going to have to, at some point, mm -hmm. leave something behind. And so, um, so I think we should do that kind of deliberately, if we, with, with care, with awareness, with constant testing, to, to make sure that whatever original human instincts or that we are going to, you know, jettison, that we're pretty sure about that. Um, and so, you know, when, whenever you, a person in their life, they make a decision, you know, you always want to kind of keep those options open, but if you move away and go there, you are going to leave some things behind, and that's the nature of growth. That's the nature of evolving. You can't hold on to all of them. So, yes, whether, it, you know, whether this kind of walking barefoot in the woods and being knowing how to plant a seed and have it turn into a plant, um, is that one of those qualities that we absolutely don't ever want to let go of? I don't know. Maybe, mm. maybe not. Um, wow. It's, wow. it's yeah. wow. certainly, I think, you know, I think the person who is the roundest, who is the most, who can access the most um, number or variety of understandings is probably the better person. Mm. But there's just going to be a limit to what one person can do. The more world views and states of consciousness that one person can abstractly reason simultaneously uh, or have in their catalog, right. uh, then that is what is this roundedness. Right. And it's gorgeous when it's, uh, there's, right. yeah. So, so, so we will, I mean, again, you know, I'm not talking about my lifetime, but you know, if we take the really long view, we view a thousand years into the future, there may be humans who literally spend no time of their life in nature. That, I, I can imagine that. That seems, wow. that yeah. seems very possible to me. There's already that happening inside of the boxes in the high rises and... To some work, extent, you know, yes. Some and extent, so yeah. um, uh, there may be other ways for us to even to, to um, meet some of those human desires. And, that, and, and this is my prediction, is because I think the technology that we are producing will become so complicated at some point that it will resemble, resemble natural organic life in its complexity. Mm -hmm. And that, wow. you know, we might, ha we ha might have um, self-replicating devices in a thousand years. We might have self-replicating devices that are all on their own, gathering energy from the sun and replicating and spreading. And that that complexity of the technium mm -hmm. at that point may resemble the complexity of or the organic world, and so there are people who will be attuned mm. to that technium, and they may get some of their, they may have no contact or very little contact with the biological world, but they may have a lot of contact with this technium. complicated technium, yeah. Yeah. and that may may feed some of their wow. desire for complexity. Yeah. So, um, um, I, I, so I don't, I, I don't, I think we are malleable enough mm -hmm. that um, we are going to change what we consider human nature. And yeah. for some people, that's very, very scary um, because it is kind of like playing God. Um, and, and for others, it's scary just simply because they, they revere this mix of qualities that we have right now um, even though they're not perfect and um, you know and others um, it scares them simply because they don't trust ourselves to to do this well and, and that's that's a fair thing to be worried about but because um, uh, it could backfire you could make some choices that you can't re, you know can't fix so um, but I'm, I'm, I'm a little bit more optimistic um, in part because I think that this is going to happen a lot slower than 
you know, the Ray Kurzweil's of the world believe. I, I, I'm very dismissive of the singularity idea that this is all going to take place very rapidly. I think this is a very, very slow thing and that if we are open-minded and if we really test and examine ourselves, we will have time to evaluate, to, 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 to you know, the, the first people who live without nature to look at their lives and see if they're being better humans. Um, and so we will, have, we will have time to experiment on ourselves. Leave it to Kevin Kelly to take something like the principle of planting a seed and having <laughs> harvesting the apple from the tree to be like in the technium. There will probably be people that don't know that, or which even today we have people that live in metropolises that don't know that. So very very interesting. And then another uh, point to continue uh -huh. on this. As we go through this process of getting into a technium, mm -hmm. that we will be architects of the social fabric that enables the full unleashing of the artists in mm -hmm. the symphony. Yes, yes. And so, in terms of the design of that fabric, there are many things at play right now. You spoke earlier of the speciation of humans mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and we've been speaking about this quite a bit these in many ways there you could view it as a bifurcation already or a mm -hmm. trifurcation in some ways there are a, approximately this number half of the people that make less than three dollars a day u.s dollars mm -hmm. a day on the yeah, planet yeah which is less than a cup of coffee at your right, coffee right. shop and then there's uh, people that are struggling to cover their, you know, the roof over their head. Um, right, right. So then there's those people in the middle that have water and that have food and have electricity, mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. struggle with rent and a car payment or whatever, right? So there's like the middle grounders. And then there's the extremers with mm -hmm. the private jets, the yachts, the right, 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 tons right, right. of cars, buying up real estate like a game of Monopoly in the metropolises, right, shopping right. for 20th designer clothes pieces of clothing uh, meanwhile walking past the people that are suffering that's right, I'm not right, one right. those are not my brothers and sisters right. so there are these already speciations that are already right, already right, in the right, fabric right, right. and then we see certain things like we we look at trees and we look at the way they sequester carbon and the mm -hmm. way that they distribute the excess carbon the large ones to the seedlings and the smaller ones that don't get so much through the roots and fungal networks and do we see that right now with our these bifurcation trifurcation mm -hmm. of inequality that's occurring mm -hmm. uh we don't really see too much of that and uh the architecting of the social fabric towards um a similar uh, maybe biomimicked process uh, could include something like a an inclusive stakeholding an inclusive fitness between that oneness uh, where it is in our best interest to help unleash the inner artists um, and that we earn stakes in that process uh, and that it's already happening everywhere around us where we use all of these products mm -hmm. and services um, and fuel the shareholder mm -hmm. wealth of those mm -hmm. organizations without ever owning any sort of tokens in that um, in that process yeah how do you see that social fabric given all of those variables just described being able to be architects to handle such a technium yeah I, I think um, I think we're in the early days of of um, architecting, you know, our society. I, 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 you know, the amnesia about the past yeah. is really shocking. Um, um, we, you know, my, you know, the, the the journey from the days of say my grandfather growing up without electricity and and you know running water or anything to to my life was 
that's the, the, that's just an amazing jump, okay? And that's that's almost within touching distance. And yeah. Um, yeah. even even my own, I mean, I, I have sometimes have troubles conveying to my own children the parochial nature of you know, growing up in the fifties in in, a, in America. How how really different it was and non-cosmopolitan and, and very, very isolated. And there's just so many things. And like, you know, again, this desert of information about how to do anything, which we, we, we the, the, it's really hard for them to mm. to understand. Like I was telling my son that, um, you know, we didn't have computers growing up and he's, he's, he was thinking, hmm. Mm. But, but how, did you, how did you get to the internet if you didn't have computers? <laughs> you know, it's like, that's a really good question. <laughs> You know, so it's like, um, and so wh what I'm trying to say about that is is is, is that um, we are right now. I mean, the, 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 until now, people's conception of who they were, what this is all about, what they're doing, what the purpose of life, and was not really about engineering society. I mean, that, that, that was that was um, that was not on the agenda. Mm. There might have been a couple people who were thinking about it, a few people who may have thought about that. But 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 this this idea that we that we have some individual responsibility to be working on this, mm. that this is the grand work ahead of us, that mm. that we are in some ways not just concerned about this person in our town, but this person who lives in Ethiopia and this person that we don't know if was walking on the street and never see that, that we are that we have any duty or obligation or anything to do with that that this is new and so um, I think the the great frontier ahead of us is us developing tools of collaboration of being able to work together at the scale that we've never been done before, at the scale of the planet. We have had no planetary awareness, no, no, no global framework before this moment. This is, I mean, the, the best someone might have done is become a nationalist, right? Um, if they were thinking big. But we're, we're now required to think globally. And, and, and it's very hard because we don't even have the information globally. And so, um, and, and so we are in the process of becoming aware that this is something we have to do of to making the society and then developing the tools that will allow us to collaborate at distance in real time mm -hmm. to do these things. Mm to spread this, these opportunities, to manage all the innumerable, incredible problems that it will create, because we are going to create whole new global problems as we try to do this, mm -hmm. all right? I mean, I'm, I'm not a utopian. Each of these new steps is gonna create new problems that we have not foreseen and can't even comprehend. And so, um, and they're going to seem impossible, and people are going to wring their hands and say, "Stop, stop, stop!" Because of these problems. But no, no, we, we're just going to solve those problems with other new technologies and new opportunities. And so, and so, I, I think I don't think we know how we're going to construct that society that will allow the unleashing of all the inner artists of everybody. But that is what we can work on, and we can work on the tools. Uh, we can work on the social technologies, like how do we vote better? I mean, literally, the little act of voting can be improved. Um, you know, there's this idea of quadratic voting, and there's just, there's just, we're just at the beginning of how we do this, and um, we haven't made much progress because simply has not been on the agenda. And um, now it's sort of forefront. It's like, well, you know, um, when we're connected to everybody else, that's really good. We wanted that. We need that. But then there's all these problems that happens when you were connected to one another. And so all the time. And so how do we solve that? I don't know, but we're going to, they are solvable. And when we solve them, 
that solution will create a whole bunch of new problems. Mm -hmm. And then the answer to that is not to stop that, but to, to solve those problems with new technologies that will make new problems. And so um, that's protopia. That's not utopia. That's protopia. That's progress. It's incremental, slow by slow. We'll make this out. It'll be a little bit better. Not by much, but a little bit better. Mm -hmm. And that creep, that incremental improvement is what evolution does. It's what civilization does. It's interesting hearing you mention that this phenomenon of global or planetary right, architecting right. is recent in maybe a couple centuries. And that... Well, it's, I would say it's recent even within the last couple 50 decades. years, a couple of decades. So it was, it was not possible to be before. It was simply, the, the, you know, mm -hmm. e even the, the picture of the whole earth came from Stuart Brand and his uh, campaign, you know, and, and, and Apollo. It was like until then, the image of it was, it was even hard to, this, to, to have it. But once that image of this sort of thing floating in the middle of space, uh, it was like, ah, oh, there, there, there's no outside, there's nothing, it's all, we're all one. And um, that, that, that's sort of where you could begin to even just to have that framework of like, well, we've got it, you know, and, and all the climate change stuff is just a, it's a global system. It has to be treated globally and there's no, you can't have a national solution to it. And so um, it's a very, very recent um, awareness. And within what you were describing around this, all of these new technologies that are being developed for the ability to manage that architecting, mm -hmm. which is the numbers are always staggering around 90% of all new data being made in just the last two years. Right, and that right, process right. Yeah, is just yeah, yeah, continuous. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And then at least now we're going to have the augmented reality technology sure, solutions sure, sure. to do that real time process, which right, you, right. you speak a lot about. Also, the digital twins, which are very interesting, mm -hmm. making a digital twin of Kevin Kelly's body, deploying some sort of a of a solution, mm -hmm. meanwhile monitoring his biometric state and then trying to see if that solution was actually conducive sure. to your yep. longevity, but then a, also a digital twin of the whole planet, right? There's all of these um, very interesting, we haven't even mentioned quantum computing or genetic engineering mm -hmm. or neural interfacing. There is all of these other, what, uh, what, what cryptocurrency is, uh, has been doing to money. Mm -hmm. um, so there's all of these different things that are happening and there's gonna be new tools that as this edge gets pushed and there's more questions that come up, there's new technologies that are made, there's mm -hmm. more opportunities. And you talk about this and I love this point, just you, us knowing how to learn, being a meta learner, yeah. knowing how to learn so we can keep learning new things as right, we keep pushing right, that right, edge, right, right. is that the one of the most important, most first principled things. Certainly, yeah, yes. I think at two levels. I mean, I, I think part of what um, part of what we are innovating, when engineering, evolving as collectively, is our ability to learn collectively. And I would say, right at this point in 2019, 2020, one of the most underrated. Um, accelerance of that learning is YouTube. Mm -hmm. It's just phenomenally accelerating how fast things learn. I was just, I mean, I'm not just talking about like makeup videos and tutorials. I'm talking about doctors mm -hmm. going to YouTube to see how a surgery is done. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about scientists going to YouTube to watch someone give a tech talk on a paper that they wrote so they can understand it better. Or on this channel, someone watching you say something right. and then getting inspired in their country across the planet to right. take initiative in starting a community around that 
Dang, uh, absolutely. I them. So that's just, but that's just one tiny aspect. That's YouTube. <laughs> that's just YouTube <laughs> of what we're trying to, what, what's happening, which is that we're collectively accelerating the rate at which we learn things. And the chief way that we learn as a species is through the scientific method. method. And I wrote one of the first histories of the scientific method itself. And my point in writing it was that in the next 50 years, the scientific method is going to change more than it has in the last 500 years. Mm. That the scientific method itself is evolving and accumulating new uh, techniques. And that science, the very method, the science itself, not just the stuff that science discovers, but the process of science is also changing. Which and is so exciting. It is, because collectively we are learning how to learn in more ways and, and faster and deeper. And the consensus mechanisms are absolutely really crucial. And you know, foremost among all the changes that are coming in the scientific method is going to be AIs. Artificial intelligences, always say plural, because there's many different varieties of them, and they are going to be instrumental in helping us because our human minds are not general purpose intelligences. That's a complete myth. There is no general purpose intelligence. We have very, very specific, weird combinations of cognition that were evolved for our planet, and they're, gonna, they're probably insufficient to understand dark matter and dark energy or to, to, you know, to discover how they work. And we're going to need to do a two-step process. We're going to invent other kinds of minds that think differently than we do to work with us together collectively to figure these out. So, so, so that's sort of what's in store for us. My only point about that is there is a collective meta-learning that we're doing, but there's also the individual assignment that we have as, as individuals to meta-learn. And that's, um, in my opinion, much further behind in, in the sense that we're not even aware of, of the issues, we're not aware that this is our job, that we need to learn how we learn ourselves mm -hmm. or to optimize our own learning. And there, there's no curriculum that I've seen anywhere in the world that teaches you or me how to optimize and understand our own learning. Because each of us learn a little differently for different things. And what we want to be able to arrive at is, is to know fully well how we would best learn a new language, how we would best learn a new physical skill, how we would best learn a new uh, discipline, how many hours of rest we need between this, how much we have to devote to the practice. We don't know, we, we, we have no idea. And this is what I think schools should really be teaching that when you graduate, what you're graduating with is a degree, a degree in self-learning, mm -hmm. a, a degree in how to optimize your own learning so that you know yourself the best patterns and techniques, the best way to learn, all the different things and ways that need to be learned, and you know what they are, and you've been practicing, and you've been tested, and you've been helped by teachers to optimize your own learning. That is what high school and college should be. There's that inner artist to be unleashed, and there are all of these, even from such ancient days of things like Bloom to Sigma, just get one on one mentorship, and that accelerates you tremendously. All the way up to today's artificial intelligence is acting as coaches that have a psychometric profile and ancestral profile they you, you've you've discussed back and forth about what this uh this artistic expression is of yours and there's a tailored daily uh, learning process of like you said patterns and techniques around that actualizing that fullest potential right and Actualizing means they're conveying to you so that you understand what it is and you can repeat that and do it again. So, so it isn't that you kind of arrive at doing something creative. That's just the first order thing. What we want to know is you want to know what that process was so that you could do it again even better and, you could, and, and more importantly that you can actually evolve or optimize that process. That you, There's enough self-awareness about this that you can get better at it. 
And that's what the true artist, you know, the Picasso somebody, is that they, mm. they sort of, um, there's a great documentary that does a time lapse of a Picasso working on one picture as he paints and repaints and repaints. And he painted the same painting over, over and, and it's like you say, well, that, and you say, well, that's fantastic. And then he, no, 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 he changed it. And he said, well, that's fantastic. And he's, he's changing it again. It's like, it's like he's looking for something. He's doing something. What is he doing? And what it was, was he was aware of what it was that he did, and he was, he was trying to sur surprise himself. He was trying to get to something that he hadn't seen before. He, he famously said he wasn't interested in beauty and prettiness. And the, all the places that we would want to stop were things that looked pretty or beautiful or cool. And he was not interested in that. He was interested in something that shocked him, that was surprising, that was different. And so he, he was an, an aware enough of how he learned and how he did that, Love that he it. could just produce these. And so yes. it's not just like we want to have a mentor to help us make creative things. No, no, no. We want to have a mentor that, that teaches us what that process is mm -hmm. so that we can evolve it and make it even better. Yes. And, and that is, that's a high bar. It's a yeah. very, very high bar. I don't know how to do that. Um, and, and maybe it requires AI to help us do this, but I mean, I think even using human teachers, we could go a lot further yeah. in, in that if, if that was the course. And the course is you graduate understanding how to optimize your own learning. Mm. Um, and so um, Love that. that would be fantastic. <sighs> yeah, that brings, that fills me with joy fills me with knowing that that is our highest potential and that it is so exciting to feel what it feels like when every single one of us is unleashing the fullest inner artist. Right. Yeah. Um, and, you know, I like your use of the artist because in m my framework, how artists go about the world and scientists go about it are very, very similar. They're, they're parallel. It's the same. Topologically, it's the same process. And in, when you have a space, uh, I'm using space as a, um, in the mathematical sense, of a high dimensional space. When you have a space with as many dimensions as reality has, meaning that there's you know, thousands if not millions of different variables that are being mapped in that space. When you have a space that's really high variable and you're trying to navigate through that, you're trying to search through the space, which is what computer scientists would use as a, as a way of um, uh, discovery, that, you're, that when you're discovering something, you're kind of going through the space looking for some peak of optimal adaption. Mm -hmm. So they would, they would make a map of success, whatever it is, and they would say, when you reach the peak, you're at the peak, and, and the life and, and the search is looking for the optimal, you're searching a path up to the optimal position. And that search, that discovery, is exactly the same process when you're inventing something. So when you're inventing, you're doing the same thing. You're doing the same search. It looks exactly the same. If you're looking at someone searching, you couldn't tell whether they are inventing something or discovering something. And that's why I would say, you know, it's like, did Ben Franklin invent electricity or discover electricity? You know, did someone invent prime numbers or discover prime numbers? Um, was the light was the Fire light bulb language. was the light bulb discovered or invented? Yeah. The wheel. They're the same thing. Yeah. It's the same process. And then the artist is the artist discovering the painting or inventing the painting, mm -hmm. creating it or discovering it. It's exactly the same process. Those those processes are basically identical. It's really the same process. So an artist who is 
coming up with something is often coming up with it in a very similar process that a scientist would come up with a new idea. I loved how you also mentioned the, not only with this way of viewing discovery, I love that, and also the the way of viewing the rapidly accelerating mechanisms that are changing of the scientific method. That's very important as we consensus figure out what is civilization's collective some knowledge mm -hmm. and how do we find these question marks at the edge how do we efficiently galvanize resources there have been some big pops recently whatever satoshi nakamoto and blockchain is was a massive pop in the last 10 years now has just been pushing a very interesting edge when you're mentioning earlier this lineage and we are descendants of that lineage mm -hmm. in many ways that itself is a biological blockchain mm -hmm. is there's a very interesting ways of, of viewing it with many orphan chains that have mm -hmm. died out along the way and many again bifurcations forks like mm -hmm. you said earlier too so the process of us figuring out how to, you know, what is your inner artist? Is your inner artist in the, seeing the overlap between biology and the distributed ledger technologies? Is your overlap between brain computer interfaces and, uh, and geopolitics? I mean, like there's so many ways to figure out what's actually at the edge, how to make unique connections at the edge, leveraging artificial intelligences to run quadrillions of permutations mm -hmm. of all of these edge pushes to figure out where mm -hmm. we should go. How do humans sim have a symbiosis with that process? Uh, because uh, is humanity a biological bootloader for a digital super intelligence? You gave us this technium a thousand years from now what role will we have will we be a, uh, a will we be consciousness in the digital super intelligence and that is what will exist how do you feel about that well I, I, um, you have to many questions there and and I guess maybe just addressing the last one yes um, uh, I, I, I think the general trends in both evolution and the technium is towards more diversity, more mutualism, more specialization. So um, I think it's likely that we will speciate. I think it's for certain that we're going to make and invent thousands of different species of AIs. Mm -hmm. And all the things that we talk about that we're from life, consciousness, intelligence, you know, self awareness, all those things are none of those are binary, and all of them are gradations and various. So there's you can have different levels of life, you know, a virus has a certain level of life, a bacterium and more. We have a lot of life. We're very living because we have so many different systems. Life is not binary. It's not like it's there or not there. There's it's a gradation and there's various kinds of it. Same thing with intelligence and consciousness. Consciousness is not binary. It's not like it's there or it's not there. There's many levels. A gorilla has a very interesting combination of different kind of consciousness. We'll put consciousness in machines of various types. So there'll be lots of consciousness around, more than we have now. Um, and intelligence is absolutely the same with, with many varieties, many degrees, many continuums and gradations of it. So we're going to be surrounded by multiple varieties of consciousness and intelligences and life, artificial lives. And... Um, What's our role is the question that we're always going to ask. And so um, 
next year and the year after, for 100 years, for 1,000 years, we'll still be asking this question, which is, where do we fit in? What's, what's our role? Why are we here? What are we good for? What can we do that these other things can't? Mm -hmm. um, I think for the short term, uh, my suspicion is pretty clear that we are, that, that the machines and intelligences we make are much more aimed towards efficiency, productivity, ask, answering things, Narrow intelligences. Humans are much more about asking questions, about open-ended stuff. We're very inefficient. We'd like to do inefficient things like art and science. Mm. Those are incredibly inefficient. inefficient. The only way you can be a good mm. scientist is if you're wasting time basically at mm. asking questions, yeah, getting cool. wrong answers, having failures. You can't be innovative unless you're going down a dead end. You can't discover things unless you have a detour. You can't make art efficiently. So we are going to gravitate to the inefficiencies, at least in the short term. Interesting. Machines, will, if, it's, if it's concerned with productivity, efficiency, it goes, get, you know, it goes, productivity is for robots, right? You just mm. give it to the AIs, and they're going to be really good at that. If you want to answer to something, you ask a machine. If you want to question, you hire a human. That's in the beginning. But over the long term, you know, we'll make machines to ask questions and we'll have to reevaluate what it is and, and again if you believe that humans have this sort of general purpose intelligence then we're kind of like we're done but I don't think we're, we have a general we have a very peculiar kind of intelligence and our value will be because we think differently than the AIs and the AIs are valued because they think differently than us um, and so the, the one thing that humans do really well is that we humans crave the company of other humans mm -hmm. and it's just really really hard to kind of fake it's, it's hard and expensive to fake another human and it's also usually not needed because we can make humans so easily that um, we are you know we're gonna seek out our company and the the company and of a human is gonna become very very valuable because we can get all kinds of company. We can make virtual telepresence. We can do all kinds of things very cheaply. But to sit like this mm. is going to be one of the most cherished, mm. expensive, valuable things that we have. And, um, you know, someone will take a plane across the country and come there, and that's, that's costly. That's expensive. Much, much... You know, it'd be cheap to come over an avatar, um, and we'll do that all the time. But we'll come to value that sitting there because you can't fake that. There's you can fake so many things. There's always, but we're, we're really tuned to that reality. We, you know, we always will will have some value of that. And so it may be that you know <laughs> our jobs in the future may be just to keep each other company to entertain and to, to enjoy that company because it's because we love it yeah the the neurophysiological effect of the technologies that we're talking about uh when i do see an indistinguishable kevin kelly that's sitting next to me here and i can't tell um, you will you will be able to tell because we took millions of years of understanding that telling process and so in a thousand years though that's a uh, you know, this is some m sure, much, sure, different, sure. much different than right. 10 or 50 years from now. So there's that. And then there's also that I'm very curious as to the really the process of self-work, the process of healing, the process of integrating trauma, the process of... Uh, marrying science and spirituality, mm -hmm. marrying uh, Hollywood and Silicon Valley, marrying the USA and China. Mm -hmm. um, there's so many of these uh, harmonizations that, that we would love to happen uh, that are part of that architecting process that you, know, you listed earlier, mm -hmm. thousands of artificial intelligences. Mm -hmm. Well, how do we make sure that we have a 
deep amount of moral and ethical and spiritual evolution, philosophical wisdom, before we choose to uh, partake in such uh, potentially... Uh, we didn't think that we would unlock the power of the atom and then have, oops, nuclear bombs. Mm -hmm. And so uh, where, was our, where was our spiritual evolution there? Where was, our, where was the wisdom there to, to hold back? Um, on something like that. So this is a, still a big mixing pot of all of those variables that... Uh, that right. Yeah. Well, I mean, I don't know. I'm, I always take the optimistic thing. That my optimism, Likewise. My yes. optimism is that, yeah, we used it twice for a bomb, and we... Albeit stockpiles still... Well, yeah, yeah. but we haven't set them off. So, So... Albeit eight hundred billion dollar per year. Yeah, no, it's a complete USA right, it's, industrial complex. Right, military, it's, it's yeah. stupid at a level yes, of stupidity, yes. but at the same time, um, so far, um, we learned something. So, um, how do we wake up? How do we wake up fully to the this we were at the very sure, beginning? Sure, sure, sure. Yeah. Um, so that way we ensure that beautiful world that our hearts know is possible. Right. Um, yeah, how do we... Well, how did you wake up? I mean, what was the process? Many different paths. And I think that's the answer. Yeah. I mean, I, 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 without trying to be glib, I think the answer is, is... I don't think there's a one thing. Yeah. I think it's... Everything. It's it's many different paths. It's it's we have to do everything at once. That's always the problem. We got to do all these things at the same time. It's not just like one thing. And so um, yeah, we want to do all the things that we know we have to do. Making sure that there's opportunity spread throughout the world. That you know there's clean water and energy, and clothing, education, and we want to have um, transparencies, and we want to connect everybody and we want to um, I mean we have these issues about you know not everybody is the greatest parent what do we do about that that's a really tough thing to say um, how about your paths yeah yeah uh, you know I, I was very very fortunate very blessed very lucky lucky beyond belief I think luck is not acknowledged often enough. Mm -hmm. I mean, basically, I'm lucky. Mm -hmm. I'm, where I am, in my view, is because I had a lot of luck. From my parents, to where I was born, mm -hmm. to when I was born, mm -hmm. I was lucky. What we want to do is we want to kind of spread the surface area of luck so it touches more people, to get them ready mm. to Prepare them for luck when it comes to, um, you know, basically expand the the touch of luck. So, um, mm -hmm. uh, it, and that's what I think civilization is in some ways is a way in which you kind of are expanding the surface area of luck so that luck has the potential to touch more people, that they can be ready for it, um, and. Uh, you know, so so that's so we have that's another thing that we have to work on doing at the same time, um, trying to um, empower luck, people. Luck can also be viewed as gifts. It can be viewed as yeah. synchronicity. It's absolutely gift. Basic needs that come up as mirrors, in a sense, in the oneness, where it does come up that once. Uh, I do a deeper amount of self-work myself that all of a sudden my relationship with my family mm -hmm. changes mm -hmm. drastically mm -hmm. with my friends, with my inner artist. Just right, right. changes drastically. And so it, we create mirrors as we awaken mm -hmm. more and more. And right now the internet and especially social media is a big mirror 
And yeah. yeah, and there's a lot of very uh, crazy reflection that's happening right now of our subconscious, of mm-hmm. our um, both our 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 greatest. Uh, drive for finding the most signal in the mm-hmm. nature of reality and also the most noise that we've mm-hmm. ever inundated right. with ourselves with. Right. So it's such a... That's why when I mentioned perfection earlier, mm-hmm. I wonder if literally nothing is impossible except to make something as beautiful as this. Yeah, I, I, I think perfection is, it's not just it's impossible, I think it's, well, it's unattainable, but it's also undesirable. So- um, You used protopia earlier. I used protopia, yeah. it was this idea of progressive pr- progress, movement towards something. Um, just like, I'm, I'm, I, I'm not a, I don't, there's lots of, Things that I think are correct about this kind of new sphere, yeah. Chardon's idea of the of the new sphere. But what I don't agree with is this idea that there's a convergence of this omega point that we're coming to a point that there's some destination that is theologically predetermined that we're headed to some end state. Mm. I, I I think that's totally wrong. What if we learn the source code of this and then make another one? Yeah, I think what is, I think there is a, I think there are directions. I don't think there's a destiny. I don't, humanity is not about a destiny, it's about a direction. So we're kind of moving outward. We, evolution, self-organized systems are radiating outward from the Big Bang, the original thing, with increasing numbers of diverse solutions, diverse specifics, diverse individuals, diverse opportunities and there's so there's a direction of a radio outward but there's not some convergence onto an endpoint so we have the evolution the world technium is moving with directions there's direction to evolution but there's not a destiny what is the directional arrow going towards it's outward. Alive. It's going to it's going towards increasing varieties. Mm. Whatever we have today, there will be more varieties tomorrow. And a thousand years or even more varieties. It's increasing specialization. So the first cell was a general purpose. And over time we made more and more specialized cells. Mm. And we made a general purpose organism with more and more specialized in Organisms. The first little bit of intelligence was general purpose, and we have more and more specific, specialized. So it goes from the general to the specific. We have a movement from the simple to the complex. We have a movement from things that are inert to more mutualistically dependent. So more and more of life depends on other lives. More and more of our own social interactions are dependent on other people. More and more machines will depend on other machines. So we have increasing towards mutualism. We have an increasing movement towards sentience, mindful acceleration of the degrees in which we can adapt and learn. That's called thinking. So there's more and more a general trend towards increasing levels of um, learning and adaption or mindfulness. So that those those are the general trends and directions yeah beautifully synthesized i want to also make sure to mention this because it's a story that um, that i think will help unleash the inner artist out of so many that are in the process of contemplating beginning or uh, still in their own process of discovery or maybe they are already on their path but they're still struggling somewhat along the way that the story about putting in these literally tens of thousands of hours of time into 
being your inner artist mm -hmm. in order to become the true best inner artist you can possibly be um, with the the the, pop, the pottery professor story is yeah 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 is yeah. so incredible yeah um, yeah you 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 can have the option to submit just one or two of your best pottery creations in for your um, for your final score or you literally the professor will take your collective weight of right, all right, of right. the pottery that you have made throughout the year and it's and the best examples of pottery come from the ones that have literally been right. doing the most weight right, of right, it. Right, right, right. And so this process of becoming your best inner artist is so deeply about these tens of thousands of hours, but it's also about um, having these really strong meta learning styles. Right, 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 right. Because right. that hacks. It hacks faster. Right, right. The fact right. that I'm here right, right now with you uh -huh. and you are augmenting my worldview mm -hmm. significantly at the age of 27, mm -hmm. plus all of these viewers around mm -hmm. the world that are also having their worldview augmented right, 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 by right, right, you. Right. It's a hack for sure. all of us because we made this happen. Right, right. And because you were gracious enough to right, also right, uh -huh. catalyze it happening. Versus if this didn't happen, we, then I wouldn't have gotten this. We wouldn't have gotten this kind sure, of like sure. hack or upgrade, right, which right, might right. shave a couple of those maybe dozens right, right, of hours right, right yeah 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 it, it's it's um it, it, it is kind of remarkable to me too that um volume numbers actually make a difference in the complexity where we talk about more is different there is actually something quali qualitatively different that happens when you have more and in the world of art and innovation the, the 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 problem is is that most variations fail mm -hmm. yep. right yeah. and so the the solution is really literally you just make enough of them that eventually you have one that works okay i mean and that's that's what evolution does it's it's sort of stupid it's the stupidest way in the world of doing it you just do it 10,000 times and and you'll get it and you'll do it better and so, um, uh, and, and that's sort of where we are. We, we have to operate in, in the real world. And so the, the, the benefit from drawing every day is that you do it again and again, and you start to, and you will do something a little differently that you just couldn't get to by, by yourself. I mean, just deliberately doing it. And that moment will take you to the next step. And you do your interviews again and again and again, and that core, repetition so to speak is like a science project where you do an yes. experiment over and over again and so um that and that um uh solution to um innovating and getting somewhere new and somewhere different and somewhere better um comes down to you know uh numbers like like you just you, you do it a lot you do it as a practice you do it as a discipline uh, you do it every day because you must, and so um, uh, that's one of the benefits that we have of being in this reality. This, you know, what I think of as our, our ride, right? You know, yes. We have the ultimate simulation to, to your to your name. We have an ultimate simulation, which is like the 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 the, the subsidy, the, the 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 quality of this brief ride that we have is just unbelievable, yep. um, and we tend to squander it, right? We, we, that's the fear. The fear is that we'll have this once in a lifetime opportunity to kind of be immersed in this thing where, and here's, here's the crucial difference you were asking before about reality. The, the, the thing about this simulation that we're in, this view, this avatar, is that we actually, in this arrangement of things, we have the ability to have an impact on others. And we have this very, very complicated system where I actually can do something and I could affect somebody way far away who doesn't know me. I mean, I can do things that could, have, could affect millions of people. I can do things that can affect people for good. I have this power mm -hmm. to impact by being in this body that has physical restraints and all kinds of things 
and senses, but that body, this presence, this, this reality, is one that's sort of built to kind of optimize our ability to have impact on each other. We can imagine lots of other uh, realities, and we'll make many of them the AR world and VR, and, and we can do amazing things in them. We'll be able to do certain things. We'll have some impact. We'll be able to have some senses, but we're not going to have the, the built-in leverage that we have in this world here. And so, you know, the, the lament from Christmas story, Charles Dickens' story, the lament of, of the Scrooge is that um, he realized that he wasn't using that life for impact when he had the chance. Mm. And it wasn't that, it wasn't so much that you're going to miss the fresh mangoes and the hair blowing through your, and all these other things. Yes, that's part of it. But the thing was is that he realized that he could have actually influenced people's lives back then, but he missed that opportunity. And so we have in this situation here been set up in some weird way to optimize our potential ability to impact each other that we aren't going to be able to replicate for a very long time. Mm -hmm. we, we can replicate lots of aspects of reality, but this one of being able to actually have the impact in so many different dimensions mm -hmm. is missing and will be missing for a long time. Mm -hmm. <sighs> wow, there are still so many ways to, to go. Um, one of the things that I, I do want to um, bring up is that there is a, a popular video right now on the web, and it's, I believe, several years old. You showed it during your talk. Um, I forget what that was. I believe it was the... Uh, uh, the Japanese artist. Oh, the hyper, hyper reality. The hyper reality yeah, yeah, video yeah. where we are, ex uh, we are mm. wearing our augmented reality technologies, and the entire world has um, added. There's a digital layer yeah, yeah. that's added onto our world that is, um, that has, you know, very much so like lots of good, lots of bad. Um, right, it's right, like right. All there, and so one of the things about hyper realities that I'm interested to, to ask you about is that there seems to be a way of viewing um, hyper-realities like something as fundamental as like a Santa Claus that is uh, some sort of a... something that's not true that we tell children mm -hmm. and then they believe it's true and that makes a hyper reality where they believe something's true than okay. when it's not. Well, yeah. So, so a lot of our fictional characters are, are like that. Like Superman has a certain level yeah. of reality as a concept. Yeah. I mean, it's like that that archetype, that hypothetical, mythical. It's a mythical character has some level of reality in our minds because it. We can share, we can share, there's something that we can share, there's certain attributes that we would agree on, there's, you know, it's, as a concept, it has a reality, even though it may not, real, may not be real in physical realm, it has other levels or spheres of reality, um, ideas are real. So, so Santa Claus is like that, it's a mythical character that has some level of reality and and that's a very basic level right. point though in the grand thing which was that you mentioned this at the beginning as right. well with this whole idea of the atom and us buying into that right 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 the atoms are all here and that the cells look and function a very right. specific way and that uh, that the uh, the galaxy and the universe function in a very specific way and so then when i look at a, a molecule of, of water, and you look at that mm -hmm. molecule of water, can we 
collectively agree that the molecule of water looks the same? Because yeah, well, well, yeah. It, it, these are the ways that maybe the scientific consensus uh -huh. uh, mechanism uh, could hopefully um, upgrade itself in a sense where um, there, there could be something that is uh, like a sort of uh, base camp or catalog of what we collectively believe is objective. Yeah, 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 yes, yeah. yes. So, so again, I, I think science is operating with that. You know, it's still very, it's, it's a contingent, it's a, it's, you know, it's a contingent consensus. But I, I, I think we're on a process now with kind of Google and some of the AI to so actually generate a corpus of mm. statements or knowledge that is graphed, that is connected together that we would come to accept in the consensus way that was true. So we would have a statement saying that, you know, London's the capital of England and most everything else in that corpus would agree with that. Therefore, it has, you know, 99.9% .9 agreement and therefore we can say, well, that's true. Um, so there is a consensus and the consensus works. Um, I'm not sure, you know, we were thinking about this, this idea of, of, of virtual realities and alternative versions of things. The hyper-reality. The hyper-reality. Is where that can be a slight issue when we have right. a, a planet that is spherical that still people say is computer-generated imagery. Right. When the space photos are released. And so th there's a hyper-reality happening where it's... Uh, there's a there's a scientific consensus that is mm -hmm. aiming to be made around uh, spherical planet orbiting right, right. spherical uh -huh. star sure, spherical sure. moon orbiting that and then there's a body of people that say that no flat earth or no it's right, CGI right, right. and so we have in a sense a sense making mechanism right, right. that is uh, deeply uh, a part of this uh, push that we've been talking about through the conversation that um, will will may, that may need these first principles like you are describing where there are these statements that hopefully uh, you know children being born into the world can uh, can enjoy the a statement like the planet orbits the star and that the breath I take in comes from phytoplankton and, and trees yeah yeah, yeah. I I'm yeah. I, I think that's mostly there. I mean, I think, you know, I, I'm not, th there's lots of issues with this kind of fake news and conspiracy stuff. I'm not as concerned about the flat earth people. That's just almost, to me, almost like a performance art. I don't really take it very seriously. But I, there, there are other issues like climate change where, where yeah. um, arriving at a consensus is much more important and much, in certain sense, more difficult. I, and, and I think, you know, as we go forward, we can enter into certain things like race and genetics, where there is going to be a lot of contention about what is the consensus and, yeah. and, and what is actually true. Yeah. And in part because, A, we don't know, and two, the process of finding out is uncomfortable. Yes. And so, and so, I, I, and, and I can imagine other things as we go forward um, where, um, uh, we w might have difficulty uh, arriving at consensus, and there may be kind of differences of how of, to program ethics into artificial intelligences or into genetic engineering. Right, right, or, or like whether you know whether to, if if an AI should at one time say I have a soul, mm. and then there'll be questions about whether to accept that or not. Do you believe that or not? What's the evidence and so yep. the whole the whole the whole issues around consciousness and how we would define it or even um, uh, verify it. So I think I, I so so I think there will be issues that we may not even know where we stand on right now that are going to come in the yes. future. Um, but I do. Uh, but I think in general um, we are moving to a, a place. And again, the thing about. The thing about these truth things is that um, they're brought in only if they can be connected to everything else. 
Um, and then they become useful. And the problem with uh, lots of things that aren't true is they're not useful. I mean, mm -hmm. the, one of the things about evolution in terms of like the evolution debate with the creationists is that the thing about evolution is that it's incredibly useful. It's with evolution, the old earth, the idea of geology and layers, that's how you find oil, mm -hmm. right? I mean, mm -hmm. that, that knowledge is used to determine where we find oil. It's, there's a use to it. Creation science is completely useless. It tells you nothing. There's no predictions. There's, it's, it's, it, you know, it's by its nature. The utilitarianism. Uh, it, right, helps. of truth yeah. is so yeah. powerful. Yeah. Okay, and so um, uh, when, when you can bring it in and connect it to everything else, it increases its values. Yeah. So like other things, things have values by how much they're connected. Data alone is never valuable. Data only becomes valuable when it's connected to other data. The structuring of it. Right, and so, and so that's the, so, so the problem, not the problem, it's like a, to me it's a self-terminating, self-limiting problem about these tr untruthfulness because ultimately they were just proven not to be useful. They can be distracting and causing problems, but they're going to disappear eventually because they simply aren't useful enough. Yes. In the long term. Yes. In the short term, they can cause a lot of problems. Yes. And there, you've used this, and we use it several times, species amnesia is a big thing where we don't yet know so much, maybe even as high as 99% of all of the archaeological excavations have yet to still be found around the planet and here we sit with this clock ticking of them disappearing right. and so in order for us to understand that or in order for us to understand something as where one person may use this word conspiracy people still want to um uh investigate into something as recent as under 20 years ago uh the 9 11 people still want to investigate sure. in and understand what is really the truth of that or yeah. even as recent as just a couple months ago with uh, jeffrey epstein right right similar right, thing right, right. people want to know what is the truth right who if any are real true puppeteers sure. or moving knobs. Right, because when we had Cambridge, Cambridge Analytic, people want to know the truth behind it, what, who was behind it. And, and so, so that, 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 that interest is not just on the right, it's, it's on the left as well, it's everywhere. People mm -hmm. understand that there are big dynamic systems that the elites, the powerful, have um, motive, have motives to um, shape the world. So it's a, it's a very natural question, I think. The, it's, it's a natural question to ask, but the difference would be what do you accept as, as the evidence of proof? What's, what's your criteria? And here's the thing in, in this new world that we're in, and that is, is that... Um, it's almost impossible in today's media to ascertain the truth of anything in real time um, by the evidence of itself. And so if you look at a photograph or text, you can't tell whether that's been altered. If someone sends you a message, he said this, well, anybody could change those letters and you could just make up something. How would I know they really said that? Or here's a photograph. Do I believe it? Well, anybody can Photoshop it. And Here's a video. Well, anybody can make a deep fake these days. I can't believe that. The only thing you can believe is the source. Mm -hmm. And the source is only believable in terms of their history, of how reliable they've been in the past. Mm -hmm. Or if they have an umbrella, or if they've been vetted by someone else who's reliable, like a newspaper or something. And so we're coming down to basically the point where you can't tell right away in real time whether something's believable, but all you can believe is their source. Mm. And so that's sort of where we are, and part of what we want to do is make a system where the sources of things are embedded into the thing so they can't be taken apart, so that you can always, so you'll be able to just say, well, where did this come from? Because that's really the only thing yeah. that we can ascertain in real time. Eventually, we'll figure out but um, in real time, we can only evaluate by the source. 
full circle because the same thing applies to this reality. It right. all goes back to source. Right. It's so beautiful. Right. Very last question. Sure. What is most beautiful? What is most beautiful? Oh boy. <clears throat> hmm. Hmm. I think um, for me, I think the most beautiful things are acts of selflessness, of um, in some ways um, a, a generous surrendering of one's own interest for the benefit of others that kind of um a kind of almost um unreasonable um help it, it, it to me is just the most beautiful thing in the world someone who you know by every logic should not um diminish their opportunities for the benefit of someone else. That's to me is beautiful. It speaks to that inefficiencies. That you right, exactly, about. right. It's, it's, you know, it's not rational, it's not efficient, <laughs> it's extravagant, it's generous, it's surprising. It's art. Yes. It's beautiful. Yes. Which in the long run may actually end up being part of efficiency. Potential. Um, no, it's, it's, the, it's part of opportunity, the expansion of choices. It's, which itself, I mean, so the thing about it is that the universe. Part of the whole. The universe mm -hmm. is totally inefficient, right? It's it's the universe is it's the most extravagant, irrational, couldn't paradoxical. Could I say the same thing and call it an efficient symphony, though? Right. It's 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 just uh, it's non-mechanical. It's <laughs> it, it's irrational. It's it's the most beautiful thing because it is an act of it's a gift it's an act of selflessness right i mean the the universe as a whole yeah. I mean, because there's because there's really no reason for it in the sense of um accomplishing um an efficiency an efficiency uh -huh. right versus a symphonic expression right unfolding. as a gift as a gift right yeah so, so, so you can almost reduce my 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 response to saying is the, a gift is the most beautiful thing. <laughs> wow, wow, Kevin, thank you, thank you, yeah. thank you. You're very welcome. I enjoyed the conversation. So grateful. It was surprising and a gift to me. This has been a huge gift to us. Thank you for coming on the sure. program. Thanks everyone for tuning in. We greatly appreciate it. We'd love to hear your thoughts in the comments below in the episode. Let us know what you're thinking about all of these topics that Kevin was talking about on the program. We'd love to hear your thoughts. Have more conversations with your friends, families, coworkers, people online about these subjects that were discussed. Get catalyzing these thought-provoking conversations around our world. Check out the links in the bio below. Again, that's both kk.org as well as uh, Kevin's other profile links in the bio below. Check those out. Go follow him. Go support his books. Go check that out. And also support the artists, the entrepreneurs, the spiritual leaders in around the world and in your community. Support them and help them grow. You can find simulation. All of our links to our show are below. PayPal, Patreon, cryptocurrency. Do support us and help us continue flourishing. And go and build the future. Manifest your dreams into the world. We love you very much, everyone. Thank you for tuning in, and we will see you soon. Peace. Great. Okay. Wow. Good.
Yeah, that was a great first round together. Okay, yeah. good. Yeah.